Screensavers were all the rage in the 1990s. From flying toasters to 3D mazes, screensavers were found on every major operating system across the land. Screensavers were a fun and loved part of the 1990s and onward computing experience. But what was the very first one created? The first screensaver? What is the story behind those early screensavers? Inquiring minds want to know. Let's dive into the glorious, amazing, important early history of the screensaver. Now let's first start with a little backstory. The story of dreaded screen burning. If you leave any CRT screen, be it a traditional television, a computer monitor, or even an oscilloscope, on for too long with the same non-moving image, oh man, you'll eventually give your CRT something known as burning. And burning is caused by the way CRTs work. The phosphors which produce the light on the screen tend to lose their luminance over time. Overuse of specific areas will eventually cause a dramatic enough change change that ghost images can appear. And screensavers were created to reduce this problem by making sure that no single portion of the screen could sit displaying the exact same image for too long of a period. It's pretty reasonable, right? So let's let's move forward to the year 1961. Yeah, this story starts back in the 60s, baby. The first known reference to something akin to a screensaver is in Robert Heinlein's sci-fi novel, sci-fi novel, Stranger in a Strange Land. I'm gonna read a little quote to you here. They went to the living room. Jill sat at his feet and they applied themselves to martinis. Opposite his chair was a stereo vision tank disguised as an aquarium. He switched it on. Guppies and Tetras gave way to the face of the well-known Winchell Augustus Greaves. Okay, okay, okay. So a fish aquarium screensaver, or something very close to it, talked about all the way back in 1961. Very cool, very cool. You got, you got a, some sort of a terminal or a display machine, and when you're not using it, it pretends to be a fish aquarium. That's neat. This was, of course, merely a casual reference in a work of fiction. Still, it's fun to note where sci-fi kind of sort of predicts reality. This happens fairly often. And many years passed without any actual screensavers being produced until 1977. Yeah, 1977. In 1977, a handful of games for the new Atari video computer system, later renamed the Atari 2600, included simple color cycling effects in order to prevent screen burn-in. Now, this wasn't anything overly fancy, right? Were these full-fledged screensavers as we know them today? No, no not, a, not exactly. But they did serve to save the screen. They just simply, after this, the game sat for a while, they kind of just did a color cycling thing. And they, if not prevented completely, they did reduce the amount of screen burn-in that occurred. Um, it was pretty cool. It wasn't, it wasn't customizable. It didn't black out the screen. It didn't completely prevent screen burn-in. But it did help, and it was pretty close to a screensaver. Let's move forward to 1979. 1979, Atari, again, released two computer systems, the Atari 400 and the Atari 800. Much like the Atari 2600 game console, these Atari computers used a color cycling effect in order to limit screen burn-in. In this case, the effect kicked in after the computer sat idle for a number of minutes. Uh, now, again, not exactly a screensaver, at least not as we know them today but it's the early steps in this direction. This is the first time we have a computer and computer software that is actively taking measures to prevent the screen burn in it. Just simple color cycling, not really overly configurable. You can't really do much else with it, but it's trying to save the screen. So that kind of counts. Now, over the next couple of years, there wasn't a whole lot of motion in the screen saver world until 1983. In January 1983, the Apple Lisa, the precursor to the Macintosh, was released. And within it was a system-wide preferences application that allowed the user to set the Lisa to dim the display after a definable amount of time. Like, uh, look on that screen here. It'll say minutes until screen dims. And then it gives a series of options, one to two minutes, two to four minutes, five to 10 minutes, all the way up to three to six, 30 to 60 minutes. Now, 
<laughs> I want you to note for a second, because I think this is hilarious. The non-specific amount of time to wait before the screen dims. I would like my screen to, screen to dim between, say, 15 and 30 minutes after I stop using it. Uh, now, I find this large time window highly amusing. Could the Apple Lisa not handle specific amounts of time, at least for screen dimming? This was fascinating to me. I don't have an answer for this. Uh, I want to dig into this further. Why there was such a huge window of, of how long you wait before the dimming occurs, you're not going to know. Is it going to be 30 minutes, 35 minutes, 47 minutes, 59? You don't know. It's anywhere in a window. How crazy is that? Just the same. This is notable because this is the first time an easily configurable, that's, that's the key here, easily configurable screensaver-like utility is provided on a computer. It doesn't do much. It just, it just blacks out the screen, but it does technically provide that functionality. Now, later that same year, in December of 1983, in that issue of Soft Talk magazine, a young programmer named Zon, John Soka Socha, Soka, one of the two, published the source code for a small piece of software that he called screensave.com, S-C-R-N save.com. This was for obviously PC compatible computers. Look at this, save your monitor screen. There's a whole, there's a whole article about it in that, that month's issue. And that first PC screensaver was pretty darn simple. It made the screen go blank <laughs> after an amount of time set in the source code. And because this was the early 1980s, you typed the whole thing in by hand from the pages of a magazine. So it was an, so in a way, this was the first open source screensaver, sort of. Uh, you want to, here's the thing, here's what's crazy. You wanted to change how long the computer would wait until the screen went blank. You modified the source code and you recompiled it. There, there's no preferences or settings or anything like that. Now, I want to make a little side note here. Many claim that John Soka's screensave.com was the first screensaver. Now, clearly the Apple Lisa shipped first, as did the Atari 400 and 800, but it very well may be the first screensaver for the IBM PC, which is already a very cool badge of honor. Also, worth noting that its author, John Soka, who is also the creator of Norton Commander would go on to significant things in the screensaver world. I mean, plus he created Norton Commander. This man, this man holds a whole lot of trophies on his shelf for computer software. Let's flash forward a bit though. 1988. Every attempt at saving CRT screens from burn-in up until now had been really, really boring, dull, black screens, a little bit of color cycling, just enough to prevent the screen from burning. That was about to change. Things were about to get a bit more fun. The first publicly released screensaver package, which contained distinct configurable, dis configurable displays, was called the Magic Screen Saver for Windows 2.0. And it was first released in 1988 by Bill Stewart and Ian McDonald as a piece of shareware. Here's, here's in fact, a picture of version 1.02 for Windows 2.0. This is Magic Control, their control panel for the Magic Screen Saver. Oh my gosh, Look, but look at all the stuff that it had in it. It had a sleep area on the screen, so you know the area where you put your mouse cursor and it triggers it to turn on them automatically. It had a configurable password so you could lock your machine. Uh, it gave you, gave you timing and it was configurable in the display of what it looked like, right? That's really cool. I mean, it, all the basics of screensavers as we know them today are here. And this is this is the early version. Uh, now, uh, the early versions of Windows, it should be clear here, did not contain any built-in screensaver functionality. And Magic Screensaver came along and added that. And this is what it looked like. This is when it was running. I mean, it looks kind of familiar, right? We've all seen the lines swooping all over the place screensavers. There's versions of that for every screensaver package from here to kingdom come. And they, it all started here with Magic Screensaver. This was it. Magic Screensaver in 1988, this was the turning point when screensavers became screensavers as we know them today. Even the name Screensaver was really coined right here in 1988 by the Magic Screensaver. These are the men that created 
screen saving. Let's, let's, let's say their names again because it, they deserve to have their names said. Um, Bill Stewart and Ian McDonald. They did it. Oh my gosh. This was screensavers as we know them today from 1988. Now, flash forward to the next year. The next year, 1989. Now, you remember how Apple Lisa, the Apple Lisa had a built-in screen dimming functionality, right? Way back in the early 80s. Strangely, just like early Windows, the Macintosh did not have anything like that, right? How crazy is that? That Apple went from producing a Lisa, which had an ability to save the screen, to the Macintosh, which did not. So enter After Dark. Originally developed by a guy named James Eastman, After Dark was a screensaver package for the Macintosh, right? The early black and white Macintosh for the most part. It was, a, it was initially an unnamed hobby project, which after it was shared with a friend at Berkeley, was acquired and renamed uh, After Dark, right? This is Berkeley Systems After Dark. This is, in fact, that, that first version. Look at that. Look at that beautiful thing. Again, it had multiple different modules of what, what it would display on the screen. They were customizable and you could turn it on and off. It was fantastic. Now, this first release of After Dark was interesting because it used no bitmap artwork. In fact, no screensaver package up to this point had, including the Magic Screensaver. It was all relying entirely on programmatically generated graphics, right? Lines drawn around the screen and whatnot. And here's the thing, Berkeley Systems did not plan on this being a big hit, <laughs> but it was. And the crew at Berkeley then scrambled to polish it up and release a new version, right? A version that was a bit fancier, a version that, version that was really awesome, right? Because they clearly had a potential hit on their hands. So 1990, this is where things really, really take shape. Berkeley Systems pushed ahead on adding a new artistic flair to After Dark as they worked on the 2.0 release for Macintosh. And they wanted to bring a Windows version to market. So what did they do? <laughs> they contacted the makers of Magic Screen Saver, right? Those pioneering dudes to modify and enhance their existing shareware software, Magic Screen Saver, thus morphing it into After Dark for Windows, right? So the 2.0 release brought with it a small pile of new screensaver animations. Now, this is After Dark for Windows. Um, this is a slightly later version for the screenshot, but you get the point. After Dark for Windows, the, the first version was, in fact, the next update to the Magic Screensaver. Cool, right? Uh, but the real breakout hit of all of the different displays that they had was the flying toasters. This became synonymous with the After Dark screensaver package. In fact, it kind of became the most famous of all screensavers. Uh, until later in the 90s, a few more appeared. But flying toasters, at least at this point in time, was it. This was, this was the bee's knees. This was the king of screensavers, was toasters flying through the land. And in a 2007 interview with Low End Mac, which is a, a website, the creator of After Dark, James Eastman, recalls the birth of those flying toasters. I'm going to read it to you now because I find it very entertaining. For 2.0, quote, for 2.0, we needed to build more personality into it, really engage. We thought this over in the abstract for quite a while. My wife's a doctor. She was doing her residency then and was frequently gone overnight. So I'd sit up late programming, very late. I had a Mac 2 with a color screen, $5,000 computer in those days. One of those late nights, I was thinking about the artistry problem, how to do something really fun for 2.0. I was wandering around the house. I drifted into the kitchen and the toaster caught my eye. My sleep deprived brain put wings on it. I went upstairs and drew some animation frames. I used the development systems icon editor. Little white outline toasters on a black background with little stubby plucked chicken wings to speed speed wings speed lines and, and a flapping electrical cord. I coded up the animation that night and brought it into Berkeley Systems the next day. It's crazy. Everybody thought it was hilarious and everybody agreed it needed to be redrawn. Wes brought in an artist to re-render the toasters and Patrick recoded the module in C. The modules all had a little control panel. I insisted on having a slider that controlled the doneness of the toast. 
<laughs> yeah, where, where, where's that at? Where's that at? Uh, see, see this here? We got a little display here. How many flying things are there? Toast and toasters. And then you have a doneness on the toast where you could slide it from, from dark and medium and whatnot. It was fantastic. Oh, I absolutely love that. The result was an instant hit. An enduring classic. There was a song that went along with it and lyrics and everything, which I will spare you right now. But if you want to go have fun, go look up on your on your favorite search engine, the Flying Toasters song with lyrics, and you'll just have a great day. You could even play it with lyrics in later versions of, of the of After Dark. Now, this brings us to the end of 1990. The popularity of the screensaver was about to explode. And wouldn't you know it, the release of After Dark, this is serious, 2.0 brought with it a screensaver module named Aquatic Realm, a virtual fish tank, just like Robert Heinlein wrote about way back in 1961. This is what After Dark's Aquatic Realm looked like. Little fishies swimming around. Awesome. Awesome. From sci-fi novel to reality, and it only took us uh, about 29 years. That's not bad. <laughs> that's not that's that's not too darn shabby. That was pretty good. Now the the fish then they they didn't look 100 realistic. They looked more cartoony than realistic, but they were still pretty great. They were still pretty great. And in the years that would follow, oh man, hyper realistic fish aquarium screensavers would become a thing. And several of the names that we've talked about so far would come back and, and become an important part of later screensaver history as well, which we're going to have to get into one of these days. But for now, that gets us from 1961 all the way up through 1990, which arguably is when screensavers really exploded. All right. <laughs> this is important history. I mean, sure, uh, not all history can be, you know, really critically important. Some of it has to be about screensavers, too. Uh, thank you to the, all the subscribers of the Lunduke Journal who make the Lunduke Journal possible. No ads, no sponsors from, from big companies, just individuals pitching in a few dollars to make sure that really independent tech history, tech journalism, it is really happening and it is, it is free from all big tech influence. I, I couldn't do it without you. If you go to lunduke.com, you get all sorts of links for where you can find Lunduke Journal related stuff uh, from podcast feeds to contact information, all that sort of thing. And there's also a whole lot of articles there on computer history and and some really rather intense pieces and and all sorts of stuff. Honestly, stuff that you're probably not going to read out, read about in most other places. And if you like some of my bigger shows, like the Linux Sucks show, if you know what that is, you can find <clears throat> excuse me every single one of them in chronological order. It's crazy all over there, along with a bunch of other big shows. There's there's tons of stuff here. Go check it out over at lunduke.com and then head on over to lunduke.locals.com to grab a subscription, free or paid. It's great either way. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, nerds and nerdettes across the inner tubes, I do declare and broadcast. <laughs>